Welcome to Big Idea Investing. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. We're going ludicrous mode today, so strap in. No, I do not hold a position in CRISPR Therapeutics as of today, but I am considering initiating one via a dollar cost average method in the next few months. If I do, I will let you know. If you stick around to the end of this episode, I will share a biotech stock that's been hammered as of late that could present a good buying opportunity. But right now, I personally am treading cautiously with the Buffett indicator, the ratio of market value to G. GDP sitting at 228% or 88% above the long-term trend line. No, this does not mean the market has to go down, especially with more stimulus expected, but I just prefer to watch at times like this. I'm also going to try to bring everyone up to speed on terminology as we go, and to effectively value these biotech companies, you need to understand the pipelines and product terms, which is why I will spend time explaining them. And if you're planning to comment saying you're late because CRISPR has had a run-up in price, please save your finger movements. I'm an investor, not a trader, and I share the same investment time horizons as Kathy and Art. So time horizons became very short-sighted, we would say. Our time horizons are five to 10 years. Sometimes for me, seeing the TAM or total addressable market of a company being big enough paired with excellent motivated leadership is all I need to bet on a horse in a race. Tesla comes to mind. CRISPR clearly has a great TAM with advanced CAR T cancer treatments and stellar leadership as well. The co-founder of the CRISPR Cas9 technology, Emmanuel Charpentier, is a co-founder of CRISPR Therapeutics, which is a big deal and Roger Novak, the chairman of the board, founder, and president has been involved with CRISPR-Cas9 since the very early days. CRISPR-Cas9 was perfected in bacteria thousands of years ago. It's been tried and tested and can be thought of like nature's medicine in a sense, which is something I firmly believe in, giving me long-term confidence in this technology as this was discovered in bacteria naturally occurring in nature first. Watch the documentary Human Nature on Netflix if you want to learn more. And before the news, a big distinction for some of you new to this space, biotech companies versus pharmaceutical companies. Biotech focuses on new drug development and clinical research to treat disease and medical conditions, aiming to develop breakthrough discoveries. Contrast this with a pharmaceutical company that typically has successful approved drugs in the market, new drugs in the development pipeline, and some do work on research as well. But biotech is about taking risk and pharma is about diversifying risk. Biotechs usually have insignificant revenue and income, and some don't market their own drugs as they specialize in research and development, whereas marketing and sales are usually the strengths of pharma companies. Pharma actually looks to biotech for innovation. Valuating pharma using DCF or discounted cash flow models is relevant, but not at all with biotech given the lack of cash flows. Biotech valuations thus are heavily dependent on pipelines and the drugs working or not. Getting excited about a biotech when a company has multiple drugs in phase two clinical trials is the norm, but we should also consider the market value of the disease in question. Orphan drugs target diseases affecting less than 200,000 people and is a term to know in the space. The FDA is ultimately the gatekeeper for biotech as they allow clinical trials and approve new drugs in the United States, usually through three clinical trials. If these trials go well, an NDA or new drug application is filed, reviewed, and then a panel decides to approve or reject with a CRL or complete response letter. And lastly, we need to understand each biotech's philosophy. Are they looking to sell approved products to larger companies in exchange for cash and royalties, or are they going to keep it in-house and build their own sales force? The latter often generates the most value for shareholders, but it's also riskier. There is, of course, a middle path of co-promoting drugs as well. But moving on, Sam Kulkarni, CRISPR CEO, just spoke a few days ago at the Guggenheim Oncology Day, and here are the big takeaways. Additionally, beyond the Nobel Prize, we also uh, had a data release last year with our hemoglobinopathies program, uh, where we showed that uh, 10 of 10 patients, seven thalassemia patients and three sickle cell patients uh, were who were treated with CTX001 were effectively um, cured of their diseases. They, they had no symptoms uh, after the administration of CTX001. And that, I think, when we look back at this time, will be hailed as a uh, very important time in the history of drug development and medicine uh, is what I believe. Yeah, I mean, the concept is very simple. I think it follows the Edmonton protocol where uh, it was realized that you can take cadaveric islet cells. Islet cells are the cells of the pancreas that produce insulin. 
uh, and respond to glucose in our in our bloodstream. And um, if you can inject these cadaveric islet cells into patients with type one diabetes, severe type one diabetes, who are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, then they don't need um, a lot of support of insulin. They can actually regulate glucose through these cells. Um, and so the question was, can you just do that from stem cells? And the only issue is, uh, yes, you can, uh, as our partner Viaset have shown, the only issue is the cells don't last very long without immunosuppression. And that's where gene editing comes in. And we now make five edits in these cells to prevent uh, elimination by the host immune system. And we hope that that product can actually be applicable, not just for type one diabetes, but also for type two diabetes. Um, so I think, you know, we're just getting started here. I mean, we went from one edit with sickle cell and thalassemia to, to three edits for our immune oncology programs to five edits now for Regent Med. And, you know, we have the ability now to go up to 10 edits in our programs. And so the more we learn about immunology and the immune system, the more we're gonna tweak these cells and make the products better and better and better. Uh, we're already seeing promising data uh, across a number, you know, at least two of our programs. And we hope that we'll see that across all our programs. But um, I think cell therapy is here to stay. And I think it's going to be a major part of medicine. So that last bit is huge. CRISPR's regenerative therapy for diabetes type 1 patients may also be applicable to type 2. 90 to 95% of all people with diabetes have type 2. Enough said. And recently, CRISPR brought on Philippe Drouet as the new chief commercial officer. I think this is vastly overlooked. I don't see anyone talking about it. Philippe brings more than 20 years of leadership experience in global pharmaceutical marketing and will lead CRISPR in developing and overseeing the company's global commercialization efforts, a crew role in this space. Philippe helped to launch and commercialize Keytruda. He was previously the VP of the U.S. Hematology at Novartis and helped launch and commercialize Gleevec, which we covered in a previous episode. This is a big pull for CRISPR in my opinion. CRISPR has its headquarters in Zug, Switzerland, but conducts its R&D operations in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm assuming if you're watching this, you know what CRISPR-Cas9 means, but real quick, if not, it's a new technology that can cut out defective genes, curing diseases in a mostly one-off event where the patient is then healed for good. CRISPR has a strong balance sheet with $1 billion in cash at the end of September 2020, and based on its current burn rate, it has enough cash to spend for the next three years without the need for an infusion of funds. But of course, as trials progress, this burn rate is subject to change. CRISPR has nine products in their pipeline, one for hemoglobinopathy, where its CTX001 stem cell therapy treats B thalassemia and sickle cell disease disease autologously. If this sounds like Chinese, make sure you click on the video in the card after this video and get caught up on the terminology in this space. But beta thalassemia is a blood disorder that reduces the production of hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is the iron-containing protein in red blood cells that carries oxygen to the cells throughout the body. People that have beta thalassemia have low levels of hemoglobin, and this leads to a lack of oxygen in many parts of the body, and some complications can include things like bone problems, Problems, liver and gallbladder problems, diabetes, hypothyroidism, and heart issues. This CTX001 is co-developed with Vertex, and Vertex is the main source of financial support so far for CRISPR. Vertex will have exclusive rights to license up to six new CRISPR-Cas9-based treatments that emerge from this collaboration. And just recently, CRISPR and Vertex published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a prestigious organization that all seven patients were transfusion-independent with 3 to 18 months follow-up after this CTX001 infusion for beta thalassemia, and all three patients were also free of vaso-occlusive crises with 3 to 15 months follow-up for sickle cell disease. Basically, in English, the trials went well. These were the first published results from CRISPR-Cas9 therapy in people with a genetic disease, and this was a big milestone with clinical proof of concept for beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. And then moving on, we have three products under the immuno-oncology banner that are all 100% owned by CRISPR and in clinical trials, CTX 110, 120, and 130. In short, these are CAR T cell therapies aiming to cure cancer. As the data from clinicaltrials.gov shows, CD19, not CV19, antigen is the most frequently used biomarker in CAR T cell therapy clinical trials for leukemia and lymphoma. CD19 is one of the most important molecular biomarkers for CAR T immunotherapy. All three of these CRISPR products are 
allogeneic or donor treated cells and CTX-130 is looking to treat solid tumors, which is a big deal. And then we have type 1 diabetes mellitus, an allogeneic therapy that is co-developed and co-commercialized with a viacite in the IND enabling phase. IND enabling studies are conducted to evaluate potential toxicity risks before human studies and to estimate starting doses for clinical trials. Diabetes mellitus is more commonly known as diabetes. It's when your pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin to control the amount of glucose or sugar in your blood. It's this treatment that the CEO Sam said he thinks could apply to type 2 diabetes as well, which would be a massive deal. And then we have four in vivo treatments in the research phase that I won't spend any more time on. And to bring everyone up to speed for future episodes, the term clinical trials or clinical research refers to studies that are conducted on people. If a treatment is successful in one phase, it moves to the next. Phase one clinical trials are conducted on limited populations to test the product for safety in healthy humans sometimes or other times in actual patients. Generally, we're talking 20 to 80 people at this phase. Phase two, these are also conducted in limited populations to identify adverse effects and safety risks and to evaluate the effectiveness of the product as well as to find the optimal dosage. This phase is typically targeted to patients with the disease in question, and we're talking typically a few hundred patients at this phase. And then we have phase three. These are the larger and more costly trials with an expanded patient population to further evaluate dosage and to learn more about the effectiveness and safety to evaluate the benefit to risk relationship of the drug. We're talking 300 to 3,000 patients who are the target population for the drug at phase three. CRISPR Therapeutics makes up a 3.46% weighting in ARC K with the value of almost $1 billion and is the sixth biggest holding in the fund. Don't let ARC selling some shares frighten you. As you can see from this chart, it was most likely due to a rebalancing effort to stay under portfolio construction limitations as the price ran up significantly in the stock denoted by the yellow line. Some people like to compare this company to Tesla and I understand why, but this analogy breaks down quickly if you go any further than just being the leader in the space. That said, yes, CRISPR is the furthest along in terms of clinical trial success, which is what has driven their share price price higher as of late. But please remember, with nine products in the pipeline and new applications for CRISPR, Cas9, and CAR-T therapies developing with each passing month, this company has a great risk-reward profile for the next 10 years. We are still in the very early days of this technology, and that's why investments into not only CRISPR with a market cap of $11.5 billion, but other companies in the space like Intelia, market cap of $4.5 billion, Editas, $3.5 billion, Beam, $6.2 billion, these could all make a lot of sense as swing for the fence risk on type investments in a portfolio. But as promised, a stock that was recently hammered in the biotech space, Sarepta Therapeutics, ticker SRPT. They focus on RNA targeting and gene therapy. Now, in gene editing, a mutated gene is revised, removed, or replaced at the DNA level. Contrast this with gene therapy, where the effect of a mutation is offset by inserting a healthy version of the gene, and the disease-related genes remain in the genome. CRISPR uses a combination of two types of molecules to edit disease-related genes, or to modify the cells, a nuclease, which is the gene editor, and guide RNA, which helps the nuclease to find the right place to edit. Sarepta won FDA approval for an injection treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, confirming Sarepta as a leader in the field of genetic medicine for rare diseases. The recent price crash may be an exaggerated reaction to one pipeline drug, SRP9001, another gene therapy drug targeted at Duchenne muscular dystrophy, not seeing expected results, but the company does have other pipeline products. I do not have a position here either, but once again, if I initiate one, I will tell you. And just so you know, my lack of investment in this space is not due to valuations, but my wife and I are heavily invested in Tesla and crypto, but gene editing would be the next space we go to. Sarepta hit a 52-week high of $181 per share and currently has a market cap of $7 billion. But listen, if you're making investment decisions on this little snippet of information, I'd encourage you to stop that price practice immediately as you will lose in the end with near zero conviction when things get tough and no idea how to create an exit strategy in the event things go well. So please only use this as an idea that you can now go research further if you'd like. But that's all I have for you guys today. Please take a moment to like the video if you did. Consider subscribing for more investing content and I hope to see you in the next video. I hope that you have a great day.